to our second episode of our Space Blanket podcast. So with this podcast, we are a group of international space enthusiasts who like talking about developments in space. And in this mesmerizing universe of space interests through different paths, we want to bring the joy of the space sector to other young people and passionate people. So this episode will focus on startups and accessibility to space. And we have our two lovely guests, Micah Smelter and Marco Morales. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. So we'll begin by introducing the both of you and then we'll have a nice chat about your journey through space and what you do. So first of all, we have here Micah Smelter, who's the community manager for the Young NL Space Campus Foundation. So she's responsible for creating and growing communities inside the ecosystem of the Dutch space sector, including regional universities, their students, startups, and government organizations. She also worked as a project manager for sustainable energy and is an has an associate degree in social work and events. And as a sci-fi enthusiast, she also sees the importance for space awareness. And in her bio, she writes, without space, we wouldn't have solar panels and I wouldn't have had a job working in a solar company. So she sees the link to use the space knowledge and a sustainable world. So. Can you give a brief introduction of what is the goal of the Space Campus and what does it mean for you to be a community manager? Um, that's, that's a very big question. Uh, <laughs> the role of the Space Campus is actually that we have a very active space business um, community in Holland. Uh, we have ASA Aztec, of course, which is like the European Space Agency from the entire Europe. Um, and it's based in Norway um, on the dunes. That's actually the perfect ground for testing. Not everyone knows that. I didn't know that before I started. Um, and the role of the campus is actually to bring those companies together that are in Norway, but also connect them to other companies and enthusiasts and communities about space. Because space is very, in Holland, it's very, um, far off, it's very hard to reach for an outsider. It feels like it's a special type of sector. Um, so we want to open it up more because working together creates more innovation and it's for a better world, of course, I believe. So working together creates more innovation from apart. So the campus is actually there to create more collaborations, to open up the world of space to people who are not working directly with space. Thank you very much. Yeah. And just as a follow up, and your role as a community manager in this, where do you, what do you see as your main role? Well, my main role is to create communities, of course, and support communities, just like with Horizon, of course. Um, but also to found the base for more collaborations, like networking events and uh, creating events with other campuses, with universities to, like for example, tomorrow we have an event with researchers from ASA, which usually uh, I hear from a lot of companies. It's really hard to work together with ASA researchers because they're very confined to ASA. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a lot of people really want to work there. It's really hard to get in there, um, but they're also just people and they have really good ideas and they want to open up. So we created this event on the campus between people who are interested, a free event that you could visit, and there's gonna be a lot of ESA researchers who work together. Um, and I think that's really unique for the Dutch space sector to actually open up like this and to have ESA work with us like this. Definitely, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's definitely also a topic that we will discuss a bit more in this uh, podcast. So. Next to Micah, we have Marco, Marco Morales. Hello. He is, hello. <laughs> Welcome. Marco is a digital transformation consultant at PACE in Amsterdam, which is a TCS innovation hub, helping organizations identify and adopt business cases in technological innovation with a user-centered approach. Last year, he discovered his passion for space, and in the last 12 months, he embarked on a startup project in Earth observation and machine learning for sustainable urban development, which was called Smart Lander, and another startup project on microsatellite manufacturing 
uh, which is now Solaris, which is its most recent uh, startup. With no prior knowledge of space engineering or science and various friends along the way, he is now designing a flat pack microsatellite scheduled for launch later this year and adopting a space first lifestyle with a long term outlook. We are now Solaris, and there's three of us. Uh, there's um, Frank Hoffman, and uh, he's our, our business head, and he has a, um, he has a, uh, uh, a metal recycling business, and he's a third generation recycler. So that really brings some interesting perspectives into the business. Then we have uh, Michele Sputniks, and he's our uh, chief engineer, uh, boss of himself, and uh, he's the only um, uh, engineer that we have, we have on the team who's doing an incredible job. Uh, and he's uh, studying in Enschede, in uh, Twente. And um, yeah, without him, we wouldn't have the electronics and the, the actual work in PCB. Uh, so that's great. And then finally, there's me. And um, I bring, I, I try to bring my, um, my uh, learnings from when I was uh, uh, an architect back in the day. So using CAD to create the, the drawings, I um, also was uh, a, a marketeer and advertising creative. So I tried to bring a little bit of that. And then over the years uh, as a facilitator, I end up just creating a space where everybody else can work in. So that's us. Um, visit our website, nowsolaris.com. Check it out. Click like and all the rest. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I'm wondering, Marco, what happened last year that did not happen before for you to get passionate about space? <laughs> well, uh, we all, I think, can relate to uh, something new that has been happening for the last three years. Uh, being locked up in the four walls of our uh, houses. And that gives a lot of room for introspection, for um, reassessing the uh, priorities that we have and thinking, am I in the right job? Am I in the right path? Uh, is what I'm doing really matter? Right? In, in that process is where um, I started looking at uh, what I've been doing and where am I headed. And I realized that there was always space somewhere in some shape or form. Um, so I have a background also in uh, advertising. I was uh, art director and creative for many years. And I've got quite a few campaigns that were based around space. And then even when I moved into service design, I came up with some games on how to innovate by taking the whole uh, the whole construct into Mars and saying, okay, you've got state-of-the-art technology, you've got people who are living in pods, how do you get them out there to do things? So that sort of thing, when looking back, space was always there. And I thought, huh, maybe that's where I should look into. And um, it seemed to tick all the boxes. Um, it was something that I was passionate about, something that I think I could do something with. Um, something that uh, I could choose as a career. So there's money in space and I need to uh, earn a living. So that's good as well. So it seemed to tick all the boxes. Um, and then I thought, right, so I don't have a background in space engineering. I know nothing about space. How hard can it be really? Um, so I started calling around, I called ESA and they said, no, you're, 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 in order to take some of our courses, you need to actually be a student, a university student. Um, and I'm uh, too old and too not student uh, for that. But they suggested that I should enter some hackathons. And that's where um, I uh, entered the um, Copernicus Hackathon and I entered the NASA Space Apps. Um, and with the teams that I entered, we won. And suddenly, huh, I'm in space. <laughs> I'm working in the space uh, uh, industry and uh, that winning of the uh, hackathon turned into a startup and accelerator and all kinds of things that moved it towards making it real. Um, and then along that line also, um, uh, I, I joined all the associations that I could join that had to do something with space. And in one of them, there was this guy who turned up and said, um, hey, I know nothing about space also, but um, I want to start mining in space because there's money in that. And I've got two grand to put uh, towards it. Who's with me? And me and another guy went, yep, let's do it. <laughs> How hard can it be? So uh, we got together, all three of us, um, and uh, we decided that if we wanted to get into mining, 
before we can drill our first asteroid, we would have to figure out how to get a drilling machine in space. And before we get there, we have to figure out how to get to space. And before we get to space, we have to figure out what is the smallest thing that we can make to throw out there. Mm -hmm. And that's how we found that uh, CubeSats were something that is small, accessible, affordable, and that we could um, attempt to actually build. And uh, that's when we uh, fun founded Now Solaris, a uh, microsatellite making company uh, in which we make satellites as we go. And that's uh, what we're busy with. Um, and that was six months ago. Yeah. And uh, this month, uh, we're ready for our first um, launch. Not to space yet, but the next best thing is the stratosphere. So we've teamed up with the um, High Altitude Balloon Association of the Netherlands uh, to put our CubeSat as a payload to their balloons. And uh, we're going to send it up there and uh, see what it can pick up with the, um, with the uh, um, sensors that we put in. So that's, uh, yeah, that's my story. Yeah. That's a great addition to your introduction. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Very cool. And I mean, also very nice to see your journey from having that drive to really finding your path and where you fit in. So I have a similar question to Micah, actually, which is, I mean, reading about your work coming from project management and sustainable energy, how did you get into space? What was, what clicked for you? Well, um, I get very excited about technology. I've always been. My dad's a mechanic, so I've just been growing up with technology. And I, after uh, my degree, I went into the solar company Arnix Scandal Energy. And uh, uh, when I was a project manager, I had a really nice job. I really liked my colleagues. And someone asked me, isn't this job something that fits you? And my first question was, I don't know anything about space. And I was like, it, it doesn't matter. You'll learn. Okay. So uh, it actually fitted really well. And the more I get into this role, the more I realize that everything is around space. And I know a lot about space. I just didn't know I know a lot about space. So that's why I see the, the bigger link between sustainable energy and space. It's just like, I didn't know solar panels were um, created for, well, first for space, and this is the area where innovation is something that it needs to grow really fast because you can't really send something into space and then if something breaks down, you just go there and fix it. It doesn't work that way. So you have to do it well the first time and that those innovations you can actually use on Earth for uh, creating a more sustainable world. And that's where my passion for getting a better sustainable world is also now linked to space, but still the technology is just really exciting. And the passion um, people in technology have is always has always been so inspiring, and that's going to be the same in space. So in my uh, when in my application, I actually said it doesn't really matter what kind of technology it is. If there's people being really passionate, I will be passionate about it too. Wonderful, yeah, and I think that's a real gift of the space sector as well that the people you meet everyone has this drive has this passion and just yeah eats sleeps and drinks space which is <laughs> wonderful to be around <laughs> yeah so uh for mica uh space and the, the space industry is actually her current day-to-day uh, -day job and i was wondering um, how do you manage working on the projects that you're working on uh, while having a full-time job at the site and the family of five. <laughs> Good to add. So, <laughs> yes, what's your secret? <laughs> uh, sleep is overrated, uh, especially when you're excited. But um, I think the trick is that we've been meeting uh, once a week. Uh, I think it's uh, sometimes Thursdays, sometimes, sometimes Thursdays, sometimes Friday nights uh, for one hour. And then uh, we look at what we're doing, how soon can we get to the next exciting part of the project. And then during the week, we just do our thing. Uh, in my case, it's usually uh, after dinner uh, or after watching some science fiction uh, movie. And then from 11 o'clock onwards, then all the kids are in bed. Uh, everybody's, uh, you know, out. So then I can just put on my music and start designing or working or doing whatever comes next. 
Um, but it is a challenge. Uh, and, and at the moment, uh, getting into uh, learning all about um, the space industry and the specifics of designing a microsatellite and learning how to combine uh, the engineer uh, mentality with the uh, business mentality of uh, Frank, our, our, our business head. And then uh, myself looking, where do I fit? Where, what can I do here? Uh, so it, it's a constant learning of how to combine it. Um, and also looking at, the, for me, the long, the long um, perspective is, what does that mean to me? At what point can I make space the main focus of my job, of my, my life, you know, my, my purpose, and so on? Um, and I'm still figuring it out. Uh, but what it means is that as I do it on the side, I also am not in a hurry, right? I think uh, nothing is going to happen within a short period of time. Whether it's uh, with now Solaris sending a satellite to space, we know it's not going to happen within a year, even though we're quite down the track in half a year. But um, we really are looking at the long term. And along that long term, we will meet interesting people. I'll hear of interesting things and hopefully I'll figure out how to make the jump or how to, to move sideways from where I am now into a much more space focused uh, area. It, that's still impressive, like how far you got right now with like now Solaris, for instance, while yeah, having a full time uh, job next to it. Like it's impressive. Like you said, you're not in a hurry, but that's that's a great achievement. I've I've got the advantage that I've um, been in the workplace for a long time, mm -hmm. and I'm familiar with agile methodologies, with lean business, uh, with uh, iterative approaches, uh, with rapid prototyping. So then, uh, with all of that in mind, it's very um, natural for me to say, okay, we want to achieve this much. We want to get to space and start drilling in space and do all this really cool stuff. But what is the smallest chunk of work that we can achieve today? And what is the uh, smallest thing that is gonna make us feel happy inside if we achieve this? And that's how we, we go, okay, the smallest thing might be to just a little cube and we design a cube. Let's design a cube. Uh, do we have uh, space-grade uh, aluminium? No. What is the next best thing? Plywood. Let's make it out of plywood. <laughs> so it, it's a way of just saying, what are we happy with? And what is the smallest thing that we can already test and try and, and uh, uh, complete before we go on to the next step? And before you know it, you're, you're finding ways to um, get there in some way or another. So we're still going, though. <laughs> Yeah. Not yet. You gotta keep going and keep, yeah, working in this agile way. I think that's that's a very yeah. useful working method, especially for this industry. And especially for the engineers. Yeah. If there's any engineers out there listening, <laughs> and engineers like to do things, uh, get busy. So uh, that's one thing that we very quickly recognized is we need to make sure that we actually do things. Um, so whatever chunks we 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 cut, we make sure we stop talking and we get doing. And now looking at a startup like yours, I mean, Mike, within your community, you also have a lot of startups. Mm -hmm. And what does, what does your community offer to help those startups, but also to help future generations with their ideas and their projects? Well, uh, as you said, we are a young foundation, so we're starting up. Um, but I'm open to talk to anyone who wants to work together and create something. Um, we have a very nice incubation program on the area, on the campus, the ESPIC, that's the one that you joined, the Copernicus one here. Um, if you are a startup and you work with space, no, no. if you work with space, um, then that's really a good way to start this program. And when you join the community that we are setting up, we network a lot. We bring together companies and uh, we open up the network for everyone if you want to just start talking to people or companies that it's really hard to reach for things mm -hmm. like this and Lisa. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and we can actually establish those networks. So I'd say to everyone who's interested and wants to do something, um, just come to me and we can talk about how we can get you to some company. We have the network and we have the company on the campus. 
Yeah, I think that's such a really valuable help because indeed those networks are, are so precious and can offer so much more movement and more growth. So just breaching those and connecting those is, yeah, be super useful for any kind of startup or someone who has an idea. Yeah, yes. and it's the same for us because yeah. this is the, the role that we have. And, uh, well, that's the only thing I'm doing, you know, day in, day out. I want you to connect with other companies. So come to me if you want to connect with other companies. All right, so anyone who's listening, <laughs> go to Mike. <laughs> Yeah, so talking about the challenges uh, for you, Marco, I was wondering what are the biggest technical challenges in, for instance, now Solari? Yeah, um, so technical challenge, and, and before I answer that, sorry, I was just thinking about the human challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So networking uh, with companies is, is great and is needed, but the challenge we have at the moment, there's only three of us, and to find people who are also interested in doing the same thing we are, um, it's difficult, uh, partly because we're all spread over the geography and locked up in our houses because of COVID, but also because we're, um, except for one of us, we're not part of a university, we're not part of a big organization, so there's a lot of doors that are closed. And then uh, when it comes to networking events, um, you meet other companies that are doing their thing. So uh, we're already using that in order to find companies that um, have something that will complement ours. For example, we're talking now to a student uh, association that is focused on ground control uh, uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. So developing uh, the ground control um, uh, component of the satellite. So that's really a nice match, but we're still three people. And we, we've posted things, we've tried to organize something, we've tried to, to attract the attention of, um, of the, the engineers that we need because we have one engineer in the team. Uh, and he's a student, so he doesn't know a lot of things. Where do these people come from? We don't know. So that, that's a challenge that we are finding. It's, uh, uh, we're looking for singles. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone's available out there. Uh, so that's one challenge. Um, then when it comes to technical challenges, uh, because we are not attached to uh, a, a big organization of any sort, it's just us three who one day decided how hard can it be to get to space. Um, we're doing everything on the kitchen bench with whatever is uh, available. We started the um, prototypes of the, uh, uh, the, the frame with cardboard before moving on to plywood. Uh, and now we're looking at how to move to aluminum. Um, so the cost of everything, of course, is high. And partly because of that, we're looking at cheap ways of doing it. Um, but also the next step that we have to go into is um, uh, the testing to make it space ready mm -hmm. and we're a long way from getting there uh, partly because of knowledge but also partly because of no access to facilities so then we're we're looking at DIY ways of testing we're looking at um, uh, industrial grade freezers that we can throw the the uh, the working uh, CubeSat into and see how long it lasts before it stops working so you know we're, we're trying to do it DIY as much as we can but at some point we're going to have to, to look at how much money do we need in order to do the proper testing, in order to actually put it into a rocket. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but that's, that's going to be a, a, a big issue. Um, and I think the other comment in terms of technical, I'll just mention is that we don't have all the knowledge it takes. So um, in the case of, for example, uh, our engineer has just taken a course, uh, an elective at uh, university on uh, how to make his own radio from scratch because we don't know how to um, do the communications for the satellite. So he's undertaking that in order to build it. So we're really learning as we go, um, but we're really also open to people to step in and uh, take control and, and basically own parts of the, the design because there's so many systems, so many different things that need to work together um, and we can't do it all. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, Mike, do you recognize these challenges that Marco has just mentioned in the groups that are joining your community as well? Or are there other aspects where you notice like, oh, this is really a challenge for them that needs to be overcome? Yeah, actually, it's very interesting what you said. Like, it's really hard for us to find other engineers. It's really hard to connect with closed groups. Interestingly enough, those closed groups have the same experience with like your type of work. 
So all of the roofs in space are kind of closed off because it's a very closed off type of sector and it's starting to open up slowly. I think that's also because of the future generation or the current generation. Um, we like collaborating more than making profit. It's a very different one from the older generation. And that's why it's opening up more, but also the technical challenges. Even at Esprit, the incubation program, they have an experimental room, but even that room becomes really small, too small for the startups that are there to actually experiment on what they want to create. So on the campus, because we're very young, we haven't built anything yet, um, but we have very far off plans for like there, we are planning on building a fab lab on this uh, next year with Isa. And it's like, it has a big clean room, it has a shaker, um, but it's all gonna be a little smaller than an Isa, but bigger than an Esprit. And it's gonna be open to use for other companies, for startups to work together and to try testing in an area that is too uh, expensive for young companies. So in that way, we're hoping to create more possibilities to try testing for companies that cannot afford it themselves. And maybe also if you have a, a physical space that will attract people to it in the uh, it's like a watering a watering hole for space uh, space uh, people right so if you have exactly. something that a fab lab of that sort yes. um, with a with a space uh, perspective then I can imagine that there would be a bunch of cool interesting people lining up to use the the, the laser cutter or something and what are you on I'm doing this what are, what are you on we're doing this sort of thing. Uh, we need these. Oh, I know someone who can do that. Exactly, so, you know, exactly. as you wait for your turn in the in the laser pattern, that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the watercolor moments are very Yeah, yeah yes. totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, I would like to go back to this DIY process that you were talking about, uh, Marco. Um, do you recommend that also to other startups that are facing similar challenges? And, and Katie, you tell us more about how do you deal with like a space project and yeah, combining it on the kitchen table, such as you're talking about? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, so I think uh, one one uh, hurdle, one one mistake that a lot of uh, small companies make is trying to do uh, something too big too soon, mm -hmm. um, and that goes not just for the uh, project goal or the deliverable that you're aiming for. So if you are going to build a, a microsatellite, you're going to be making the best microsatellite with all the sensors and all the things and all the, you know, because you want something awesome. Uh, but if you do that from the beginning, uh, the journey to get there is so long and hard and high that you're going to lose a lot of, um, a lot of uh, strength and stamina along the way. So it's better to, to, to choose what is the smallest little thing that I can do now and, and then figure out the next bit when you get to the next bit, and then so on and on. So that's one, one thing. Um, the other one is get a little creative um, on what can you use as an alternative. So let's say the cardboard is not going to survive space, but if you make a, I mean, a CubeSat is a box, right? It's just a box. So if you can use a cardboard cutout, to at least figure out the space that you have available within that box and start designing your PCBs or get a sense of what can you fit in there, you've already gotten somewhere and you've already made out of a, a, you know, a, a delivery box uh, from a supermarket, you've already cut it out and you've got something in your hand that looks like something. Um, and then uh, you cut some shapes in the, in the shape of a PCB and then suddenly you, you're able to stack it and you're able to go, huh, how does that attach to that? What other ways are there? Um, so we, we do a lot of that. Um, so from a, from, a, uh, from a physical perspective, we can do that. From a technical, no, from a software a writing perspective, we also look at um, who else is doing things with microcontrollers in, in space, microsatellites. And so Arduino has got some solutions that are uh, really good and useful for small kits. Uh, it does the bare minimum, right? Mm -hmm. other, other proper engineers snigger and, and are horrified that we're doing this. But it's a good start, right? It, all we need at the moment is just a couple of um, 
a couple of sensors that will pick up temperature and pressure, that's it. <clears throat> when we go to the next step, our engineer is already looking at what is the next or bigger version of the software he can use. Um, but also in, in running our operation, I'm the mission control person. Um, so I looked up uh, the official ESA, so the ESA and the NASA um, uh, platforms. And um, I looked at a couple of other platforms that offer a sandbox environment for startups and for people who are beginning. Uh, Eclipse Suite is one of them. Um, there's a couple more out there. So we looked at them. They're huge, right? They're so big and massive that um, you get lost. So also with the software we use, um, from the very beginning, we're using Excel Sheets and Google Drive, and we're keeping it small uh, because there's no point in uh, adopting something that you think you might need uh, half a year from now because maybe you don't get to that point. So pick up whatever you need today and for the next month, that's it. And figure it out as you go rather than trying to plan everything because it's not going to work out like that. So if I understand correctly to the potential startups, you're saying break it down and keep it simple. Absolutely. That's it. And, 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 and keep it to a point that you... Uh, look for the, the happy moment, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going to make you happy? And everybody's going to have a different goal, right? So your, your uh, manager, your controller, your, your mission control is going to go, as soon as I have this, this Gantt chart in front of me, I'll be happy, right? So give them that Gantt chart. The engineer is like, yeah, I just want to soldier something that is going to, I press here and that happens. Yeah. Then do it, right? So everybody can find what is the smallest things that are gonna, is going to make them happy, Bring it together, and whatever is going to uh, overcomplicate it, leave it for the next iteration. There's always a next iteration. So then, if you think about it like that, you can do the minimum because whatever doesn't fit there, you'll do it in the next uh, in the next uh, sprint, yeah. and so on. So then it's okay to leave things for later and focus on the bits that you can do now. It's very true. Very good lessons learned to give out to other people focusing on this. But I'd also like to go back to what both of you were mentioning of the, those water cooler moments and that networking that is so valuable, but that also really is the, the human challenge because how do we fit all that networking into one day? Um, so, I mean, we have a community manager here. <laughs> what are your like, best practices or tips for, for networking for, for students or for startups who want to, to reach out? What is the best way to do this? Well, there's one thing that I'm noticing from a lot of startups, especially very technical startups that um, exist from only engineers. They have a very cool idea. They want to go really, really fast, exactly what you said. But they forget the part that a lot of growing a business is getting investors and doing marketing. And I know a lot of people think marketing is not something that I want to do. Uh, it's really hard. I'd say do something that suits you. Do what you like to do. If you like to talk to people, talk to people. If you like to write something, write something. If you want to create a video material, do that. Just do what suits you, but get your story, your idea out there. Because no one's going to help you, no one's going to collaborate if you do not get your idea out there, because people don't know you exist. And I think that's the most thing. You could stay in your basement, but nothing's gonna happen. So go out there and let it be known, but do it your way that suits you. And I think that's the best way that it works. That's why I don't like to collaborate with people and say, this is what we're gonna do. No, it's like, what do you like to do? What do I like to do? And how can we combine those two things to create something that we both like to do and exactly get that moment that sparks your passion and makes you happy. And that's when the magic happens. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And I think I, I like that you said do it your way, uh, because I think there's also the, um, the, the, the tendency to say, well, OK, so we have to do marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, how does marketing work? And they look it up online and go, oh, you have to create a newsletter and send it to so as many people <laughs> say, oh, I don't like to do that. And I was a marketeer. <laughs> so I think doing it the way it, it, it suits you is uh, it's a, the, the perfect way to do it. Of course, you have to figure out what that way is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but in our case, for example, we're also looking at how do we attract people, um, and 
in one thing that I have, I have a, a, a background in, in partying and DJing <laughs> and all this sort of thing. So I'm like, well, it would be cool to attract that sort of people. Um, people who can see space not as an engineer domain, but as a, as a much wider cultural, fun bunch of people to get involved with. Um, so then, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of marketing that we want to do is using the launch of our CubeSat on a, on a high altitude balloon. And what I want to do is get um, a, a few of these balloons sorted, invite a few artists to decorate the, the uh, cubes, and suddenly you have a floating exhibition, mm -hmm. and then invite a, a DJ, a bunch of people, and turn it into a, a launch party, right? Perfect. So, Very nice. <laughs> That's, that's the idea, right? How we get there, we, we're working on it. But that's, um, that's what works for us because that's who I am and I'm, I'm bringing that and the other two guys are like, sounds good, just do it. <laughs> you know, they don't mind me taking over that area. But indeed, it's uh, whatever works, whoever you want to mix with, um, find, find your tribe, right? And sometimes also you have to do something so that you can show what you're doing that's where images become so important. So that, um, because if you tell someone, hey, I'm building a group set, that's not the same as showing some photos of a bunch of people in a launch going, yay, you know? There's a big difference. So I think you also have to do your groundwork and um, you know, burn the midnight oil, get whatever you're doing, and then put a little bit of effort in the photos that you have or, or package it in a little in a way that you can actually communicate what is that you're doing and then others will go hey that's kind of cool right exactly even if you don't like taking pictures or you don't like to get the word out there find someone who does mm. because there will be someone who gets excited by your idea and then wants to do that like I like organizing events and I know a lot of people do not like to do that they like to be on stage they like to talk about their passion Mm -hmm. I like to create the stage for your passion. So if you just come to me about your passion, I get passionate about organizing something that you can tell about. So even if if that's the way you communicate or do marketing, just yeah, do that. But if you exactly like you said, if you do a newsletter because the internet tells you to do that, you can never keep it up. You lose your enthusiasm, you lose your energy and it just it's not a good way to go. And, and I'm, I'm just going to flip on that, what you said about find the right people. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping no, over. <laughs> but because I think one decision we made early, and we keep making that decision, is let people who are good at something do their thing. Yes. And that way we focus on what we want to do. So yes, we want to do a microsatellite, but why? Because we want to drill um, uh, asteroids. Mm. So um, we're not in the business of high altitude balloons. And they look complicated. They look easy at first. As soon as we start looking at it, you have to have special gloves because then uh, your, your, your um, uh, natural human wax, if it touches the balloon, when it gets to that height, it becomes solid, it bursts the balloon. It's complicated, right? So that's when we thought, you know what? Let's look for somebody who does this who knows how to do this and let them do it. And um, when we look at all the different aspects that come in, that's why also we were looking at someone who uh, is happy with the ground control aspect. They're going to be working on it, fantastic. Let's collaborate, let them do their thing, we'll do our thing. And um, I think that applies to everything from marketing to business to presentations to engineering to all the moving parts that you need for um, uh, a little startup to, to move forward, then focus on what you can do and look for allies that can do what they're good at. And then together, hey, you know, let, let's, let's go forward and enjoy the, the, the fruit of working together. I think that's the value of the new generation because to do this, you do not, cannot be scared that someone else will like, steal your idea, for example. Those are the foundations before collaboration happens. So you have to be transparent to actually collaborate when you are. And I, I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I think indeed uh, when you're a startup, uh, nobody's going to steal your idea. As in, you're too small. Come on. You're, you know, I think you need to get to a certain size before you start worrying about who's going to steal your idea. 
there's so much work to be done. There's so much space for everyone to have a part of it. You know, we could have 20 CubeSat projects here in the room, and I bet that all of them would be different. So we're not going to be stealing each other's ideas. We'd be going, how did you solve that? And how did you do that? Because everybody is going to have their own uh, uh, reason for doing it, their own uh, science payload attached to it, their own whatever. We're not going to be, oh, don't look at my cube. It looks totally <laughs> different to your cube. Oy. You know, I think that's a, indeed a mentality that we need to overcome, open it up, let everyone adopt it, use it. The more people that we have working on, on similar things, the stronger we're going to be. And there's a marketplace for everyone. Right? Find your people, find your market. Mine is going to be DJs in space. Right? So <laughs> I think everybody can find their, their niche, and there's one for everyone. And also the, the collaboration through different passions and bringing that together to create something great, I think is a very valuable message to take on board for any further endeavors. So a question that we also couldn't leave out uh, and also talking about uh, collaboration and, and meeting other companies. Uh, how did COVID <coughs> impact yeah, both of your uh, positions actually? So for you, for instance, uh, community uh, outreach. Uh, well, um, the foundation started about two and a half years ago, and I got on board about half a year ago. So it was in COVID that I started. It was in COVID that we founded. It was in COVID that we created everything, and it's really complicated. Um, yeah, it just makes you very creative. But also, I've been doing events for a long time, and. What I'm used to now is you organize an event and then uh, every week you keep asking, can we still do it? What's the new rules? Like, how can we be creative with the new rules? Um, and then we just do whatever fits that time. Um, and it's not the same, so I'm very glad that things are opening up again, but we have postponed most goals because we cannot do community work with not seeing anyone, this small remote experience, that brainstorming online is just not the same. Networking online is not the same. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> uh, without, uh, without uh, COVID, uh, we wouldn't exist, <laughs> right? Because um, it was COVID that made a lot of the um, hackathons available online. Uh, where before they used to be uh, location-based, oh, nice. right? Um, a lot of the uh, webinars or localized events that happen, now they've gone online, which means I can access them. So a lot of the stuff that I've been involved with, the people that I've uh, connected with, the communities that I've become a part of, I wouldn't be there if it wasn't because uh, there was this, this forceful push for everyone to get online and, and start talking. So I've been able to attend, uh, I think, just about every, except for maybe one or two, um, uh, Space Campus uh, online uh, events, because they're online. Um, if I had to take time off my job in order to drive uh, or in order to, to be physically present, uh, I live in Amsterdam, and transit it becomes an issue. I wouldn't be able to attend this event. So for me, it's been great to, to have I'm not saying that it should continue on forever. I'm saying that um, to have defined that space was my thing and be able to then join some online events and uh, communicate with others and, and start working with others has been great. And now I'm really looking also forward to uh, moving back to a hybrid model where we can combine the physical aspect, like you were saying before about a, a, a fab lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a physical thing. And it's yeah. great to have. Uh, I mean, I imagine a great, uh, a, a great warehouse, you know, all painted white with spacecraft bits everywhere, and engineers, people in white suits having a beer or something, right? That would be awesome. I want to be in there. In well, between, DJ as well. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you're gonna have good tunes in it out of this world. Um, but at some point, uh, once you you leave that place, it's also nice that you can then connect with people who are remote from other countries or from the other side of the... I mean, my, my two uh, business partners are in Enschede. 
And that's a bit of a, a drive if I wanted to see them uh, yes, uh, yes. more often. So how to find that balance? I think that's where we're hopefully shaped together, to figure out what did we learn during the lockdown that we can bring into the, into the open world um, and what things we need to keep the physical and the, the person and the face to face. Yeah, so, yeah. this actually leads very well to my final question, which is for you, how do you see the future of this kind of space networking and outreach? I mean, one, taking into consideration really the developments that have happened also through COVID of a lot of hybrid and, and online events, but also the fact that you see more and more smaller space communities forming. I mean, Space Fluencers is one of them as well. You have multiple different Discord channels or, or online platforms. Do you see that developing into even further, like spread out small focus groups, or do you see it merging together at some point? Oof. Um, well, I, I think uh, there's just more opportunities to get together. Um, and just like you said, that we haven't found it in the founders and before COVID, they, it also created a lot of opportunities. And we can combine those two, the, the physical part, the online part, uh, and get together in that sense. And I think because there's more small online communities, you can find, it's easier to find something that suits you. But working together is also easier even when you're more far off because the online thing is still there. Mm -hmm. And because we are all pushed into the online thing, everyone is more comfortable with it. So it just created more opportunities, I think. Um, we just have to see what's gonna happen, but I think there will always be communities because we're people, people. <laughs> Yeah. But from, from your perspective and from the, the space campus, would, would you want to see these, these communities getting closer together again? Or do you think the development is that you're going to have just more like specified groups breaking off? I'm not really sure. I think it's both. Um, I think people would specify more, I mean, probably more smaller groups that would also work together. So then you have like some parts that you do specific type of collaborations and then um, some parts that you would do more together with more people. I don't think it's one or the other. Okay. I think um, uh, I was, I was uh, part of the early 2000s dot uh, com years and um, what you had was a lot of web designers of which I was one. Uh, spread all over the place, working in all kinds of companies, and we were all trying to figure out this internet thing. And therefore, forums were the place where we all went to. Mm -hmm. And uh, in forums is where we would say, how do you do this? How do you do that? Right? Um, so we helped each other. And then out of those forums, which were sort of regional, right? They were well, not, not for the city, but just for certain regions, also because of language, and uh, somebody had to build the forum. and. Initially, it was a group of friends, and then it expanded, and that's how uh, it started, right? All these forums. But at some point, um, you, you would have so many channels in the forum, so many different teams, everybody would do their own thing. But then um, there would be some small events popping up, and then um, some channels started doing uh, some physical events that attracted people from other forums. And then uh, over time, it became that uh, there were a number of national events. Uh, organized by these forums. Uh, some of these forums now have gone on to becoming uh, online training uh, academies and that sort of thing. So, you know, there is a pathway there. So it might be that something like that happens here as well, where you have everyone is, is scattered in their own little pockets. But I think as we mature, and by mature I mean six months, because it's only been that long, right, um, since uh, some of these businesses have started on, online, so um, as we move forward, we all find like, hang on, we're three people in this Discord, and there's three people in that other one, and there's four people in that other one, and we're all here trying to talk to things and go, hey, come here, come here. So obviously we're all noticing this. How are we going to move forward? I have no idea. But I think people are noticing, right? People are, are saying, why is nobody coming to my Discord? Why is everybody there? But then they're saying the same thing. So. I think now is the time to start thinking, all right, how do we bridge this? How do we still 
own our own little corner that we started, but also reach out and do something together with everyone else. And then who knows what will come out of it? I have no idea. What I'm saying is we've been there before. <laughs> the dot com years, the internet, you know, we yeah. survived, we grew. So I think this is uh, also going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah, you already also gave us a, a glimpse that you would see more uh, hybrid characteristics in the future. And my final question to you would be um, what do you expect from the space industry in the future? Like, what kind of benefits to startups like you bring? And what do you expect from the industry to boost startups like yours? And by the industry, you mean ESA and. Uh, all the companies that are involved. It's, it's a <laughs> bit too general. Yeah. The industry. <laughs> the space because industry, I think yes. we all help each other in like, okay, NISA provides us with uh, locations, with events to go there, but other companies have to go there to actually benefit yeah. from each other. So, yeah, from everyone in the space industry. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I can think of, uh, and I don't, you know, that's such a big question, but uh, because I'm trying to figure out what is my spot, what is my place in, in this brave new world, um, I come with a uh, with a, with a backpack full of things I've done in the past in my current job. So if I look at uh, job opportunities or what those roles are, I don't see an equivalent, right? I don't see where that fits. All I see if I look up uh, jobs in the space industry is engineering or project management or uh, policy making or a couple more things, right? Mm. Managing funding. I don't come from any of those backgrounds. So one thing would be how do I bring my uh, uh, many years of expert knowledge into the space industry without losing it, right? Without also having not having to start at the bottom again. Uh, I've done you know enough that I don't need to 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 start as a junior again. So. Helping that transition um, uh, into the space industry, that would be helpful. Uh, and I don't know if that's a, a, an effort from HR or from communication or from uh, the companies that are, that are putting out these saying, okay, maybe we need to uh, realize also that we don't only need engineers, we need also the people who are going to get engineers together to talk to the business people, to talk to that. You know, there's a lot of people in between. Um, the other thing is, uh, I guess, um, but maybe this is our fault because we're we're not attached. I, actually, I'll tell you what: uh, opening up universities to non-university um, uh, participants or stakeholders or whatever you want to call it. If there's a, a framework that that opens the door for a collaboration of some sort, because I also understand as a university, you you can't just go, hey. Uh, anyone who wants to hear, come use our yeah. facilities. But if there was, uh, at the moment, I found we found a lot of closed doors, saying, uh, "Which uh, university are you from?" No, no, we're not. Oh, sorry, I can't talk to you. Yeah. Closed door. Yeah. Right. Uh, which uh, faculty are you? Uh, no. Oh, sorry. Then, completely out of uh, out of bounds. So, that lack of of, of ability to to com enter a communication. I think that would be really useful yeah. if there were ways to, to establish a conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting because you want to collaborate more with other space companies, but you also want to connect with and with students, uh, with students, with um, so as part of universities, you know, we, we are like, okay, we've got a cube, we've got space for a, a payload. What's going to go in that payload? Mm -hmm. We would yeah. love to ask students, yeah. hey, what can you guys come up with that's going to fit into these and we're going to send it out. Yeah. But we can. That links quite well then to the space I'd campus. I'd love right? to bring that <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> This is exactly what we're looking for. But I do have to say, you are talking to organizations that have a very bureaucratic way of doing things. They're kind of old fashioned and they're closed off. They need to get used to opening up. They're scared of opening up because they've been closed up for so long um, and they have a way of doing it. But startups have an entire new way of creating a culture inside a company that old companies do not have, like ESA or universities. There's so many rules and insurance and I don't know, we're, we are in the Netherlands, so we know about rules. 
So um, it's hard to break down walls that have been built up for the past 50 years. And you've only been doing this for six months, so you don't really have any walls. Um, so let's not forget that those people are mostly just not used to doing this, but they want to. They, they are passionate about it too. So if you find the right link, um, they will help you, but it's, it's just not easy. So slowly, it just takes time. <laughs> just like they've been building up a wall for 50 years. That's not how it takes 50 years to get it down. Um, but I think probably a little more than six months. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot, of, a lot of possibility, a lot of opportunity. Yeah, yes. yeah indeed, a lot of chances. And um, really interesting. Thank you both so much for sharing your stories and your insight about all of this. Um, so we open up the floor for one or two audience questions. Yes. Yeah, um, with the networking of companies, especially working with ESA, and with how global space is becoming, you see a lot of opportunities for working with similar organizations in other countries. You mean non-EU companies? Non-EU, but also working with you know a similar organization in France, for example, because you know, language barriers aside, which may or may not exist, um, a Dutch company in space would get just as much out of working with a Spanish or French company as they could networking with another country. Yes. Is that something where, as space is more and more galvanized internationally, is that an area where you see your, your community expanding? Well, the, the space community isn't very large. Uh, ESA is actually a French company. Uh, most people who work there, even in Nordic, are Italian. Um, so there's, it's easy to work together. Everything is international. But working with non-EU companies is like a political international thing. And that is complicated. Yeah, take maybe one more question right at the back. Yes, uh, I had a question from Shimon uh, about the, uh, you said it's better to uh, separate the task into a small uh, part and then think about the next uh, complicated situation once you reach the next complicated situation. But uh, it, doesn't this happen often where you, when you reach the complicated stage you, and you go back to the first, then you realize that uh, most of the stuff has been changed and it's actually kind of useless? Uh, and in the second situation, you uh, change up most of it. So it is that you value more the psychological aspect behind it, about the satisfaction that you're actually getting something behind it, or uh, over time, over the time spent on the task. Well, um, setting aside the, the psychological aspect, let's look at the uh, engineering aspect. If you look at uh, small increments, what you're doing is you're spending less effort and time in building something. So by the time you get to the next stage, let's imagine that you have to scrap everything, all right? First of all, you wouldn't have gotten there if you hadn't done that work first. So that takes you further. Uh, if you have to scrap it all, that's okay. Then build, build forward, right? Build to the next bit. Um, but also, you don't waste that much because it didn't take you that long to get there. So if you spend six months working on something, yes, that's a big chunk. But we're talking about two week increments. Right? So what can you do in two weeks? What can you, you prepare in two weeks? Uh, and if you look at that, worst comes to worst, it, it was a failed uh, uh, direction. Now you've learned that it was a failed direction. Right? But now you know where not to go. Um, but even then, you've lost two weeks, not two years. So that's why uh, small chunks, little by little, will get you further. You, you will be able to learn and validate things much much earlier before you spend too much time or effort or money in getting it longer, really complicated, and then find that, yes, you do have to scrap everything. Okay, final question? Yes, uh, I have a question because, uh, as we know, each country has a lot of embassies. The Netherlands is really famous because FEO is uh, trying to engage with embassies around the world entrepreneurs and people who want to engage in internationalization. And I know that they, at each embassy, they have also people focused on space, reliable data projects. And uh, in this current time, last several of months, they arrange a lot of business days, business weeks in America, uh, Germany, 
uh, yesterday in India, next week in France, uh, and uh, each embassy has also their own community. Uh, their own responsible people, so they are also not only trying to engage by the governmental perspective, but also focusing for viewable activities. So instead of uh, looking and uh, searching around, there are so much of people that get debates and simply survey if you know to ask the right question or to get reason that is not picked and that is declined. So uh, is there also uh, communication with the Dutch embassy? Because I know that they are openly, they have their own community with entrepreneurs and projects in each country around the world is only from the Dutch perspective, I'm not speaking uh, from other countries. Yeah. And ASA is also active in uh, Belgium, I understand, just do that from our training of, uh, in Bremen a couple of years ago. So uh, there is a lot going on, but uh, uh, we need to, to connect and, and discuss and not uh, looking what the government wants, but looking what the citizens of the entrepreneurs want, because they are, they are, and they are everywhere. Uh, the question is from me, right? Yeah, it's all viewable. Is, is the interest to, uh, is the connection with Dutch embassies around the world? Because they have, in their people work in this space. I seriously don't. Yeah, I think uh, it's two different types of community mostly. Mm -hmm. First of all, we are a young foundation mm -hmm. and we are part of a region deal, which is a regional <laughs> creation. And we're trying to open up space for more people to uh, get involved with space. But if you are a business and you want to work together, there's a company called Innovation Quarter and that helps mm -hmm. you invest. Um, we work together with Innovation Quarter for companies. So we are like the platform to, again, network with the right companies for you. Mm -hmm. So if you come to us saying, I need a, an investor, I need a place to stay, I need um, so an area to build my satellites, we'll just connect you with Innovation Quarter um, and then they can help you further. But if you just want to get into contact with other companies, then that's what we come in. Okay, well, it's uh, a little bit the perspective of dividing international organizations in members. Well, ESA is an international yes, organization. Yeah. yeah, and space is a very small company. <laughs> I think uh, we will end it there and we can continue these conversations. Um, but again, thank you both so much for making the time for coming here, for sharing your stories and for giving us these answers. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I'm very honored. So yeah, and well, as with the start, there's so many more collaborations and chances in the future. So we'll see what comes from that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.